the second of the 2019-2020 Iowa Files. My name is Gail Brubaker and I'm the Executive Director for the West Des Moines Historical Society. Um, the Iowa Files happens free of charge because of the members of the West Des Moines Historical Society, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Public Library, and especially their staff who have been boxing up hundreds of thousands of books over the last week. So they are exhausted and they're doing great things for the community. Today's presenter, I'm not sure if you noticed this guy wearing the old tiny <laughs> uniform up here. Dress is funny. Dress. No, it's not a Dodgers uniform, but we'll let that go. Today's presenter, Professor John Leopa, has been called Iowa's Mr. Baseball. He's a lifelong baseball card collector. He owns an extensive collection of cards and memorabilia representing Iowa's 221 major leaguers, including Iowa's seven Hall of Famers. He's a charter member of Iowa's Field of Dreams chapter of the Society for American Baseball Research. He's had numerous articles on Iowa baseball published. John has made, is it over 151 now? This is about 151. Uh, all right, presentations on baseball history all throughout the Midwest. Well, that's since I retired. 2010. Okay. <laughs> he's kind of a troublemaker too, as you can tell. So we are really thrilled he's here today because it is time for baseball. It's October. So, ladies and gentlemen, Professor John Leopold. Um, I'm in mourning. I'm a Yankee fan. All right. And uh, but it was a good game, and I had picked Houston to win all along. They've got the best pitchers in baseball, and that's usually how it works out. Uh, I did, and also, we're all going to sing happy birthday to Mickey Mantle today. It's his birthday. All right, no, you don't have to do that. But I did bring along, this is a little cutout I, a couple years ago from 2012, and with the World Series starting on Tuesday, <clears throat> a ticket in 1946, about the time I was born, cost between a buck twenty to six twenty-five. Today it starts at 120, this is 2012 numbers, 120 up to 1,040 for a ticket. A hot dog was 50 cents in 46, now it's $10.50. Um, a program, 25 cents, 15 bucks now, all right? A player's bonus was $3,700 in 46, now it's $377,000, all right? A ring, $100 value today, $10,000 estimate, and those are figures that are about seven years old from this article. But um, anyway, um, I'm happy to be here. And the timing for this program was not just by chance. I, when I talked to Gail, uh, I knew the dates when the World Series was scheduled to start, and I knew there'd be interest in the game of baseball, and most of you are here because of that. But I wanted to just make a couple of uh, announcements before we get started. And the PowerPoint does run just about an hour, a little bit over, so if anybody has to leave, I won't be offended. <clears throat> for eight years, Michael Gardner at the Iowa Cubs asked me to write short articles on Iowa history and for the publication, A Thousand Words or Less, Iowa Baseball History. And I brought along just a few copies of some of the Cubs programs. They're free. If anybody wants to take one and, and read the articles, you're welcome to do that. Uh, they gave me boxes of them at one time. And then they cut out the yearbooks about three years ago, I think it was. But I had a good run of about eight years writing and researching articles. Uh, also, some of you are aware of this. <clears throat> this publication no longer exists. Um, it was put out by the State Historical Society of Iowa. I was on the board there for five three-year terms. And uh, Jenilee Swain, who was the editor, uh, had seen my collection 20 years ago and asked if I would do a series of articles on Iowa baseball history. I do have some copies available, so pick up one of my cards. I don't have a lot. And, but I wrote five articles for this, including a lot of the information you're going to get today. And this magazine was replaced by Iowa, the Iowa History Journal, Michael Swinger, the editor, lives here in West Des Moines, and <clears throat> he knew about my research and my writing, so Michael had asked me a few years ago to write an article on baseball history, and this was the initial article, and then he enjoyed it, and he said, how about a three-part series of articles? So anyway, the next issues that ran from May and June of 2018 through September and October of 2018, uh, three issues, you can get back copies if you're interested from Michael, and contact information is in here. And after we're done today, if you want to do that, I mean, that's fine. Lastly, <clears throat> I did a program before, I lived in Indianola up until two years ago, and we moved here to West Des Moines. And um, 
But they, in elementary school, does a program on, uh, the kids study all kinds of different topics, but one was sports. And it was great because this one class of, I think they were third or fourth graders, they wanted to study about Roberto Clemente, and who's one of the great tragic figures and maybe the all-around best player ever to play baseball. And so anyway, uh, I did a program for them, but before that, in the spring, Michael Gardner had asked if he could send down a photographer to photograph my collection at my home and do an article for City View. And they did, and then he said, well, now you have to come up to the ballpark so we can take a bunch of pictures. Well, it ended up, when I met with these kids, the thing that sort of warmed it up is I showed them the picture that appeared on the cover of City View, myself with Cubby Bear. <laughs> and, and, you know, I was impressed when they knew who Roberto Clemente was. And, I mean, they knew a lot about him, and I do have his rookie card up here. Uh, the kids all wanted to see it, and they wanted to hold it and have their picture taken with it and so on. But, uh, so it was an extensive article about my collection. So I've had a lot of fun. I did teach college students for 40 years before I retired, and one of the reasons I retired is what I'm doing right now. Um, as Gail said, I've done over 150 programs uh, since I retired, probably 250 totally in the last 30 years on baseball history. So I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, you're welcome when we finish here. It'll take just about an hour, and uh, we'll have a little bit of time afterwards to come up and look at the collection if you haven't already. A lot of the images you'll see in the PowerPoint are up here, including Iowa's oldest known baseball card. Uh, there's a photograph of Iowa's first professional baseball player who I'm dressed as and I'll talk about in a little bit. And um, so anyway, let's get started, Gail. Uh, do we want to hit this? You got it. Okay. <clears throat> If you think about what used to be the three major sports, basketball, football, and baseball, um, can you think of colorful characters in either, fo or either football or basketball, like Yogi Berra or Leo Drocher or Satchel Paige, and some of the great quotes? So I have interspersed in my PowerPoint some sort of memorable quotes, and I wanted to just, I had some here too, and I'll just read two or three. Um, there have been only two authentic geniuses in the world, Willie Mays and Willie Shakespeare. And that, that was from Tallulah Bankhead. And I, I love this one. Never root for a team whose uniforms have elastic stretch waistbands. That's from Susan Sarandon, who was in A League of Their Own and so on. Um, but, you know, there are colorful characters in the sport. And this one here, Leo, he had a nickname. A lot of you know it. We've got hardcore baseball fans in here. Leo the Lip, all right? And you get an idea just reading one of the quotes from this guy. That, uh, so, uh, next, Gail. <clears throat> what we're going to do here for the next hour is first address the myths surrounding the origins of the game. And even before you see the next uh, image up here, uh, no one invented baseball. It evolved, okay? And we don't have to have anyone inventing baseball. I think it makes it a lot more interesting if you look at all the people that contribute as this game evolves and changes uh, and new things are added and so on, and you'll see some of that. Um, then we'll look at you know, the early history a little bit. We'll look at uh, the different rules that the game was played under and we'll look at basically what it was uh, like before, just before the Civil War, and that's about when it reached Iowa in 1858 in Davenport, and we'll look at uh, how it spread and the role that, for all the blood and carnage, Civil War uh, played a major role in serving as a catalyst for the spread of baseball, and we'll look at that a little bit. Uh, and finally, you'll look at some of the early Iowa players, including Calvin Alexander McVeigh from Montrose, Iowa. Uh, who played for the first all-professional team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, in 1869, thus the Gothic Sea. And you'll see some images of Calvin McVeigh. Next. <clears throat> I like to start my presentation with this image. It's a Courier and Ives lithograph from 1866. And it depicts two teams from the New York area, uh, New York Mutuals and the Brooklyns, and they're playing against each other at a place that is very special to baseball. It's the Elysian Fields, taken from Greek mythology, at Hoboken, New Jersey. And these players would leave work, and they would get in boats, and they would go across the Hudson River, and they would play the game of baseball. And, but the reason I like to show this is there are sort of three elements to the myth overall about baseball. One is, and if you think about Bob Feller playing catch next to the barn or bouncing balls off the barn and so on, all right, you like to think it's a rural, small-town game. That's part of the mythology about it, all right? That the second part of the myth is, and you can read it, the American national game of baseball, that it was invented by Americans for Americans, and it's better than all that other stuff, all right? Uh, that's just not so. First of all, it wasn't invented, and there are a lot of other people that had input as the game evolved from especially England. 
you mentioned earlier George Wright and Harry Wright and a lot of other people, Henry Chadwick and a lot of other people that contribute. And um, they were immigrants here. And they knew of other game, bat and ball games before they ever were introduced to baseball. So um, the third myth, and this, this is where we're going to start, is that in 1839, on the shores of Lake Otsego in Cooperstown, New York, Abner Doubleday called boys together from two schools and in the sand with a stick, drew a diamond shape, and then introduced something approximating the modern day game of baseball. And we'll destroy that myth very quickly. Uh, there's hardly any baseball historian left on planet Earth that believes that. There still are a few people clinging to that. And so think about this for a second. How many of you have been to Cooperstown? I know a lot of you have, a number of you have, okay. Um, it's there because of a myth. I mean, it is, all right. Uh, Cooperstown probably had baseball, you know, back in the 1830s and so on, or something approximated. They had children's games that approximated baseball. So those are the sort of the elements of the myth itself, that, you know, it's a rural or small town game, that it's an American, a uniquely American game, and that it was invented by Abner Doubleday in 1839 in Cooperstown. All right. Major General Abner Doubleday, a great American hero. He truly was. Um, he was at Fort Sumter when the Civil War opened. Uh, he was at Chancellorsville. He was at Gettysburg. Uh, a, a lot of these people that play a critical role in the evolution of this game did have Civil War backgrounds. And there's been a, a list put together of all the people who ended up playing baseball that were veterans of the Civil War. Um, Doubleday went on to a successful career as a businessman, as an elected official. And, that, uh, so he is, and the one key element to dispelling the myth is there is in existence 67 volumes, all right, of diaries kept by Abner Doubleday and his family. And they are digitized today, and you can go read them for yourself. Don't bother reading them looking for baseball, though. All right? Next. Why the myth? Because of this guy. The Spalding Sporting Goods Company is still around, and this is the man responsible. He's in the Hall of Fame. He deserves to be there. Um, <clears throat> Albert Spalding, 253 wins, great pitcher, great player. Played in Illinois, all right, then in the, uh, when the major leagues were started in, in uh, 1876. And, uh, but Spalding, from the 1850s to the 1870s, had an ongoing debate, uh, not quite that early, I guess it started about the 1870s, and it went to the end of the century, with Henry Chadwick. Henry Chadwick was a reporter, a journalist for the Brooklyn Eagle, and in the late 1850s, and he did come here from England with having played cricket, knowledge of cricket, and, you know, basically, he swore that this game was not uniquely American. He said that it evolved a lot of other games, including children's games, town ball, rounders, uh, two-cornered cat, one-cornered cat, a number of games that involved bats and balls and either stools or bases. You ran to something after you swatted at it with a broom handle. <clears throat> How many of you here in the audience, and some of you that are a little bit older, will probably remember this, but do you remember a game called Worky Up when you were kids? Remember anything about it? You had three people at bat, all right? As many kids that showed up that morning were out in field. There were two ways to become a batter. One is to work your way up, right field, center field, left field, third base, shortstop. If you put someone out, you worked your way up each time. The other way was to catch a fly ball. You immediately took the place of the guy at bat. In doing my research, and I'll pick up some books here as I talk, uh, there were children's games that were similar to working up, in the 1800s, early 1800s. And my brothers and I, I grew up with three brothers and my sister here in Des Moines, uh, on Saturday mornings in the summer, we'd head, help, you know, head up to the playground after breakfast, and our mom wouldn't see us until that night. And we played all kinds of variations of baseball, but Worky Up was one of them. And it just kind of amazed me, I started reading more and more about these children's games that predate baseball that were similar to Worky Up. So, two books that I recommend highly to anyone that wants to get sort of the <clears throat> definitive word on the origins of baseball. John Thorne is the official historian of Major League Baseball. I've met John, national conventions, other places and so on. If you can't read it back there, it's Baseball in the Garden of Eden, the secret, the secret history of the early game. Now, I don't think they played it in the Garden of Eden, but there is evidence of ancient Egyptians playing games with sticks, and, or sticks and swatting at round objects. Uh, there's evidence of early Native Americans when Lewis and Clark went out there doing the same thing. Not lacrosse, a little bit different than that. The other, I never met David, but I have talked on the phone with him and so on. Um, David Block, it's called Baseball Before We Knew It, 
a search for the roots of the game. Those are probably the two best things written on the origins of the game. And believe me, neither one starts with Abner Doubleday in New York in 1839, neither one. They have a lot of chapters before that, a lot of them. Uh, about five years ago, they came across, and I think Thorne might have been the one that discovered this, it was a city ordinance in the late 1700s in Massachusetts, all right, that they discovered, and the city ordinance banned the playing of base and ball within 50 feet of any public building because the kids were breaking out too many windows. This is shortly after we became independent from England, shortly afterwards. So, <clears throat> all right. So the, the debate between Chadwick and Spaulding about, you know, is this an American game and who invented it and so on, it goes on for a number of years. And Chadwick is, you know, he had come here from England, and as a journalist, he started covering some of these early games played in the New York area. He fell in love with the game, and he had played cricket before. Chadwick is the father of the box score. Some people call him the father of baseball. We don't need a father just like we don't need an inventor. There are a lot of fathers to baseball. But uh, the end result of Spaulding's research, all right, is this book. I didn't bring my copy with me. I do have a copy. But you can look at the cover, Baseball, America's National Game, by A.G. Spaulding. It was published in 1910, 1910-1911. And look who's on the cover, Uncle Sam wielding a baseball bat. How more American can you be? This is the result of a commission that was set up by Spaulding to help basically come to a final conclusion as to how this was a uniquely American game. It was called the Mills Commission, a former veteran of the Civil War, who Abner Doubleday knew, was put in charge of it, Abraham Mills. Next, go ahead. <clears throat> and on that commission, they included Morgan Bulkley, the first president of the National League. They included um, a couple of former players. George Wright was on that commission. The national director of the Amateur Athletic Union was on the commission. A couple of senators were on the commission. They wanted a commission above reproach when they came out with their conclusion. But they were all friends of Spaulding's. They had the conclusion before they looked for the evidence. They had the conclusion. Next. All right. In all my years of teaching history, one of the things I tried to instill in my students is that history is process. It's not cut and dried. It's not etched into stone. This book came out within the last 10 years. Baseball's creation myth, Adam Ford, Abner Graves, and the Cooperstown story and the Cooperstown story. And <clears throat> this is Abner Graves. And Graves, there's an Iowa connection. Graves was called in when they had that commission set up as an eyewitness to having seen Abner Doubleday call those kids to the lakeshore and draw the diamond and outline the rules. Well, the problem with that is he would have been four years old. He would have been four years old. And there are other problems, too, which we'll get to in a minute. But he did live in New York, and he lived briefly in Iowa. He owned a couple of cattle herds. He lived by Dow City. He lived by Denison. He brought some land here. He ended up as a mining engineer in Colorado, and he ended up being declared insane after he killed his wife. All right? But he was a key witness in those hearings about the origins of the game. Abner Graves with an Iowa connection. And that, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. All right. So how do we know? that Abner Doubleday had nothing to do with inventing the game. There's two key things. Those diaries I mentioned, there's 67 of them. If I had invented baseball, somewhere in diary 20 through chapters 6 through 12, I would have written about having invented baseball. There's not a word. There's not a word. The other problem with it is, I'm a veteran, some of you are veterans. He's a West Point cadet. He's a sophomore at West Point in 1839. Not in 1839, not in 1939, not in 2019. Do they let you go home from West Point in the summer to invent baseball? <laughs> they have attendance records. He was there, okay? So the whole thing is just, you know, basically, Spaulding wanted to make it the American game, and no matter how he got to the conclusion, he was going to look for the evidence and come up with that conclusion. The book that you saw earlier by Spaulding, it's a great book for baseball research, except for the first two chapters. Skip them. It's a lie. Start after that, all right? And that, uh, so <clears throat> history is process, including understanding the game of baseball and the origins. Go ahead, Gail. Uh, oh, back, back. Back one more. 
I said, oh, you're going the wrong direction. Just, just there we go. Okay. One of the things, this game had all kinds of names. As a children's game, I gave you some of the names already. But you'll see base and ball, two separate words. You'll just see ball by itself. You'll see baseball hyphenated. And a lot of different rules. Uh, look at the date. We're part of England, and they're playing this. 1744. The ball once struck off, away flies the boy to the next destined post. Not a flat plate on the ground or anything like that. And they had trap ball and stool ball, different versions of children's games. But the objective was the same. You ran to certain positions or posts, and you tried to get back. And there was a ball involved, and you know, so on. And of course, there was no equipment like we see today. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then home with joy. All right, next. Uh, the date, 1820. Uh, steamboats have reached Iowa by 1820. 1820 is the Missouri Compromise. Missouri's allowed into the Union, balanced with Maine. Uh, they're already debating slavery by 1820. But you can see already that the ball and the bat, and these kids have some kind of uniforms on, um, woodcuts showing children playing the game of base and ball. Lots of different variations on what we called it as the game evolves. Next. I know where this is. I've been there, and probably a lot of you have been there. 1834 is the year after. Iowa was open for settlement. The Black Hawk Wars were fought in 32, and then in 33, the government was surveying and so on, and pioneers poured in. Uh, this is the Boston Common, the Boston Common, with a capital in the background. And these are kids probably from kind of an elite school. They have really spiffy uniforms. But this woodcut is, you know, in a lot of the baseball history books, and it, uh, it shows, again, you know, basically um, the bat, the ball, a uniform, and so on. But notice a couple things. You'll see this, all these early images. Um, there are no gloves, and we can talk about that in a little while. There are no catcher's masks. And these are kids. They're having fun. Next. <clears throat> I've mentioned cricket a couple times. You heard Henry Chadwick's name. You're going to hear more about George and Harry Wright, also English immigrants who had known and played the game of cricket before they came here and became Americans. I ask people when they look at the two images, juxtaposed top and bottom, in one or two words, what's the immediate, you know, one or two word reaction to what you see on the top compared to what you see in the bottom? How are they different? What's, what's a word you might use? Anybody? Action. Who said that? <laughs> Outstanding. Action, drama, excitement. Top picture, boring. They stay clean. There's no dust flying. How can you get excited about that? I mean, yeah. Well, you know, years ago when I was in grad school, I played rugby at Iowa State, and I was a bartender for a while. And a lot of uh, students, international students, lived in Buchanan Hall, and they would walk to where we served beer. They didn't have cars. And so I invited some of them to come and watch a, a rugby match. And they did, but there was a trade-off. I had to go a cricket, watch a cricket match. Boy, did I lose on that one. All right. Rugby's two 40-minute halves, and it's over. Two 40-minute halves. Cricket, they said, come on Saturday morning, bring something to drink and eat. It started about 10 or 10.30 until sunset. And then they said, we're going to resume tomorrow at noon. We're nowhere near done, all right? And I had to ask, you know, what happened? I, mean, I do know something about cricket. I've got some books, and I've read about it and so on. But again, you've got something like a home base, and you've got something like a flat paddle, and you're swatting at something like a ball, all right? And there's some of the language is similar. It does evolve out of cricket. In my research on Iowa, when I was reading newspapers from the 1850s, cricket was mentioned far earlier than any mention of baseball in Iowa. It was here before baseball ever reached Iowa in 1858. Next. Another <clears throat> Harper's Woodcuts. I brought three with me, which I'll refer to over on the bench here. And there's a little article about Harper's Woodcuts. Harper's Woodcuts give us, gives us one of the best visual records of the evolution of baseball. The first woodcut appeared in 1859, and you're looking at it. And what they have there is on the top, they have a cricket match, and on the bottom, they have a baseball game, and they're being played at the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey. Harper's woodcuts come out in the late 1850s, and they appear until the early 1890s. And there are about 30 images of baseball and baseball players, and I do collect them. I've got about 25 of the 30, and you can just see the progression visually of how the game changes. And they're not that expensive. This hobby stuff is very expensive. Uh, there was a Mickey Mantle 52 Tops card in pristine commission, or condition that just sold for 1.4 million, something like that. The Hannes Wagner sold, um, there are about 23 of those, 
2, 3.2 million, the last one that sold in, in great condition. I mean, they're out there. <clears throat> but anyway, these are affordable. And if you sort of, you know, want to look visually at how this game changes, they're a great way to do that. I have images in a uh, clipped together article over here of all the images of baseball that appeared in Harper's, uh, you know, weekly. And <clears throat> go ahead, next. <clears throat> this is one of the most prized photographs to early baseball history collectors. This shows the New York Knickerbockers. The New York Knickerbockers were businessmen who, after they left work, usually twice a week, would go down to the Hudson River, they'd get in a boat, and go across to Hoboken, New Jersey, to play baseball. Uh, look particularly at the guy in the back row. That is Alexander Cartwright. In 1845, Alexander Cartwright came up and proposed a set of rules different than the rules that were being played in New England and in Philadelphia that went back to the 1830s and 20s. And he thought they were an improvement. Now, <clears throat> one of the gentlemen here, I'll tell you in a minute, you could probably guess, but one of the gentlemen here introduced a new concept that the other two rules didn't have, a position called shortstop. His name was Doc Adams, or Lucius Adams. And which one do you think's the doctor? Of course, the guy smoking a cigar. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Doc Adams, all right? So it wasn't even, you know, Alexander Cartwright plays an important role, but he didn't invent baseball either. He contributed to it, along with other members, you know, of this team, of this team. And that uh, in 1846, on June 19th, they did play a game under the New York rules, and a lot of people said this was one of the first games, I'm, again, careful, one of the first games played under those New York rules. What you're going to see between 1846 and the Civil War is the New York rules will slowly, you know, replace the Philadelphia, the New England rules, players found them preferable. What you're going to see is that some of these players from the New York area would go to the New England area. They'd been playing teams from there for some time, but they agreed to play a doubleheader, one under the New York rules and one under the New England rules, and let the players decide what their preference was. You'll see the New England rules in a second. Next. <clears throat> one of the early other publications, in addition to Harper's Weekly, was Porter Spirit of the Times, and you might not be able to read it at the top, but it says, A Chronicle of the Turf, Field Sports, Literature, and the Stage. Beautiful masthead at the top, and a lot of more works of art. But down at the bottom is Baseball in America. And you can see, again, it's two words there without a hyphen. Again, a little bit different. Uh, next. I have it turned up to that page on the table up here. Uh, what you're looking at is how they played the game in New England. Some of you might have read this. <coughs> In the 1850s, though, there's no standard requirement for what a ball looks like, what a bat looks like, these town teams, whatever they could afford. You don't see standardization of rules until the late 1850s, and then obviously by the time the National League comes in in 1876, or 1869 and 70 as the first professional teams are being put together. You'll see some standardization. With the town teams, no standardization. It's, some of them have really nice uniforms because they had wealthier sponsors. Others, ragtag uniforms, and you'll see some examples of that, too. But uh, what I want you to notice, though, without seeing the details, look at the shape of the playing field. It's kind of square, and it's not even a perfect square. <clears throat> you have first base, second base, third base, fourth base, and the striker, that's the batter, is in the middle at the top, the catcher behind him. So he's at a position between two bases. This game had a couple of other how many fielders could you have in the New England rules? As many, up to, up to 20 fielders. There were no foul lines early on. You could get a person out getting the ball on the bounce. And the one I love is the New England rules early on, if the player was off the base, the ball was hit to you, you could throw it at the runner. It was called soaking or plugging, and he was out. All right? You threw it at the runner. I can't imagine today at 100 miles an hour, Chapman, you know, beating somebody or someone like that. But anyway, so <clears throat> this is one of the games that the New York rules was up against, and they will win out eventually. Next. <clears throat> the 1860 election, four candidates. The least popular president in U.S. history, Abraham Lincoln, wins. He had a plurality. He had three opponents, Stephen Douglas, John Bell, John Breckinridge. The Democrats split the vote. And, you know, with just around 30% of the vote, Lincoln becomes president. Think about that. In 1864, when he's reelected against McClellan, <clears throat> he, 
He's a regional president. He's America's only regional president. The South has a president, his name is Jefferson Davis, and they don't recognize Abraham Lincoln. People forget that. Lincoln, we know as a rail splitter. We know him as a wrestler. A lot of people don't understand he had a love for baseball. What this Harper's <clears throat> cartoon shows, I'll just read what Lincoln says. Gentlemen, if any of you should ever take a hand in another match at this game, remember that you must have a good bat and strike a fair ball to make a clean score and a home run. And notice how much bigger Lincoln's bat is than the opponent's. After he's elected president in 1861, after the war started, and after the Battle of Bull Run in early 1861, Abe Lincoln had a baseball game organized to be played behind the White House. And they let you know, federal officials come to watch the game. He and his son watched the baseball game. He knew about the game. He was well aware of it. It was being played in Illinois by town teams and so on but before he became president, before the 1860s. So he was well aware of it. There were teams in Springfield before that date. So Lincoln was aware of baseball. All right, next thing, Gil, you know, thank you. <clears throat> I mentioned the Civil War. And from 1861 to 65, um, a very famous chromolithograph, this one, and you can't read it, it's real light letters, but on the bottom, it says Union Prisoners at Salisbury, North Carolina. At Salisbury, North Carolina. And what it shows, it shows in the middle Union Prisoners playing baseball and the Southerners watching. Before the Civil War, baseball is being played in the South, but think about it. The largest city is New Orleans, and baseball was being played there. But Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy during the Civil War, has 16,000 people. It's still a very rural part of the country, and baseball spread much, much slower. You'll see some other images. But here's what's happening. These kids from places like Iowa that were picking up the game, uh, you know, basically a lot of them, they're spreading the game through the South, either as prisoners of war or soldiers that occupy parts of the South. You'll see another image. And of course, they're going to take the knowledge of that game back home when the war is over. <clears throat> the Civil War, when it starts out, there were great pitched battles that lasted days, or, you know, Gettysburg, two and a half days, uh, Antietam, 24,000 dead in one day, and so on. But then there were six-month lulls, where there was a lot of tedium and boredom among the players, and everything, whether it was, you know, competing, throwing knives, or hatchets, or wrestling, or gambling, or drinking, or playing baseball. That happened during those lulls. There are lots of Civil War diaries, and let me show you a... <clears throat> Baseball in Blue and Gray by George Kirsch, the national pastime during the Civil War. This is filled with diary references to watching baseball. And I do a program for... I've been a 20-year member of the Des Moines Civil War Roundtable, and um, I was invited to go down to Kansas City to do a program just exclusively on the connections between baseball and the Civil War. That's a very different program than one I'm doing here today. But this is, again, one of the better works on all the connections between uh, that tragedy and the great game of baseball. And that um, <coughs> they're learning, they're watching, the prisoners are. The prisoners are. Next. Two more images relating to the Civil War. This is 1861 Fort Pulaski, Georgia. Standing in the foreground is a Civil War unit from New York City, but that's not the important thing. This is the only actual photograph of a baseball game taken during the Civil War. They're playing baseball in the background. Union soldiers from New York playing baseball at Fort Pulaski, Georgia. Spreading the game of baseball. Spreading the game of baseball. One more with the Civil War. I love this. When you finish your duty, tour, whatever it is, two years, four years, six years, a career, 20 years, all right? A lot of times you have that regimental picture taken with your buddies for, you know, those whatever time period you were there. And this is one of a unit about to go home at the end of the Civil War. But what's important is not the spiffy uniforms and the guns. Look carefully. In the middle, on the ground, are baseball bats. Baseball bats. And they're taking those home with them. And they're taking the knowledge of the game home with them. They know the game. Think about it, a lot of, in the Civil War, <clears throat> if you enlisted as a farm kid who was semi-literate, okay, you oftentimes voted to who your officers would be, and they would, they would be people with more formal education. They would be doctors or lawyers, or they would be business people that traveled. They had more exposure to the game of baseball than some kid living on a farm in Iowa. And so a lot of times that's what happened, is that they were taught the rules during the war, 
by some of these people that either were their unit or another unit that was familiar with the game. And that was another way to spread it. But next. <clears throat> I love this, Harper's woodcut. This is immediately after the war. We can date this. Look closely. No gloves. Look closely. No catcher's mask on that guy about to catch the ball. Uh, but what I love is that grand pavilion in the background with the red, white, and blue bunting. The game of baseball has exploded. It has exploded. And this, we can date this. We know the catcher's mask comes into existence in 1877. Gloves somewhere in the same decade. But they were very different gloves. Looked like a golf glove or something like that. Very different. It wasn't manly to have to wear a glove. It was a badge of honor to have twist and gnarled. Somebody described hands of baseball players as ham hocks. Raw, broken, twisted. That's a real man. But as the ball was standardized and got harder, you didn't want ham hocks. You wanted protection. You wanted protection. But uh, now, let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. All right, this will be a good place to backtrack a little bit to Iowa. You can read another great quote. Uh, the spitball is permitted until the mid-1920s, and one of the seven Iowa Hall of Famers was a renowned spitballer, Urban Faber from Cascade, Iowa. And they actually allowed those guys to continue throwing the spitball after it was banned, a certain number of players. So, uh, and you read some of the stories about the stuff they did to a ball. They had emery boards, and they had little knives back there, and they had bubble gum and chewing tobacco. They did all kinds of things in their back pocket when they were pitching. And so, now, all right. <clears throat> Backtrack to 1858. When I was on the board at the historical building, I spent a lot of time on the second floor reading old newspapers. And when Jin Lee had asked me to do some research on the origins of the game, I spent hundreds of hours, I mean, until my eyes couldn't take it anymore, reading that microfilm on those readers. And having taught Iowa history, Iowa has a pattern of settlement that makes some logical sense. It's southeast to northwest along the river valleys. Almost all the first in Iowa history, the oldest city, Dubuque, the first newspaper, Dubuque, the first bridge, Davenport. That's what I was reading. Where the news, I was looking for a meeting, any mention of the word baseball. And there was mention of the, name, of the game in Burlington that predates 1858. But the earliest date, and again, I'm careful as a historian, nobody's been able to find an earlier one, with a specific reference to a club being organized, was in Davenport in late May of 1858 the pastime baseball club number two. That was, it was called, and it was organized by descendants of George Davenport, the founder of the city, and Antoine Leclerc, city named after him as well. They were business people in Davenport, and they called together a group of people and put together this baseball club. There's very little evidence of games being played before the Civil War. I found some in Keokuk, I found some in Mount Pleasant, and found some in Dubuque and Davenport. Those are, you know, about it. And these are town teams. They represented either wards or they represented a particular trade. It might be the carpenters against the blacksmiths or something like that. It might be generational, it, the old guys against the young guys, the first nine against the second nine. And again, the rules were not standardized, but most of them by this time are well aware of the New York rules. And that's where they're moving. Next. All right. <clears throat> um, a statistic. In 1865, when the war ends, there are fewer than 20 town teams in Iowa. Fewer than 20. In 1866, the next year, there are 50, around 50, and I'm careful again, town teams in Iowa. In 1867, there are 200 town teams in Iowa. 200. Des Moines in 1865 has one called the Capital Cities. By 1867, they have nine town teams. Nine. Davenport has seven. Dubuque has, I think it's eight. So it exploded. It exploded. I go back to my use of the word catalyst for the Civil War. When these kids came back, if you know, they weren't injured or sick or whatever, um, as you settled in Iowa, your priorities were the following. Shelter for your family, number one. A school and church, two and three, and a baseball team, four. Those were the priorities. They were, it literally put you on the map. There is in the Council Bluffs non in 1866 an article about a women's baseball team being put together. A women's baseball team. In 1867, there is mention of an all-black team in Keokuk. An all-black team. 
That's early. That's early. Next. Oh, let me comment about this. Go back one. I have up here in the case, this, again, I'm careful, is the earliest known baseball card depicting Iowa, a baseball team. And you can see yourself at the bottom, the first nine of Washington, Iowa, their baseball club. That's what the BBC stands for. Um, they've got the photography, you know, the name of the photographer down there. And we've been able to research this. When I was doing all that reading of, of looking for the origins of the game, I was also looking at early box scores from 1865 on. And I was able to find them in Fort Dodge and Marshalltown. And we were able to find this box score from 1867. And we've identified all the players. We knew what they did in town in Washington. The captain is always in the middle when they did a portrayal like this. The captain is 33 years old and a veteran of the Civil War. All the others are younger than 25. The youngest is 17. They represented a variety of trades. A couple were farmers. There's a pharmacist in there. There's a banker in there. And that's basically it was done in small towns in Iowa. But this is, you know, um, a friend of mine in Pittsburgh made me aware of this card uh, many, many years ago, and I was able to work out a trade on this thing. And, that, um, and it's one of the prizes in my collection. And I'm more than glad to, you know, somebody finds an earlier one and can prove it. I'll call it the second oldest baseball card known in Iowa. But up to this point, nobody's come up with one earlier. Next. <clears throat> when Gail introduced me, she mentioned I've done programs all over. And I have done programs all over Iowa. Titanka, New Virginia, Sloan, all the biggies. Uh, basically, I've done, you know, almost every senior uh, center here in the central Iowa and so on. Mostly libraries. And I was doing one in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, about four years ago. And Christy Vilsack made me aware of a gentleman that was an avid baseball fan that wanted to come in and visit when I was doing my program. And he came in and he had a three-ring binder with two sets of cards that his father had collected from the 19-teens. And over about a two-year period, I helped him sell those sets. It included a Babe Ruth rookie card and a, a very rare set from San Francisco called Collins McCarthy. Um, which came out in 1917. And, uh, but the best part was what he, else he brought in. <clears throat> I didn't unwrap it today. I do have it with me, and I'd be glad to do it for any of you. But this is probably the oldest known baseball piece of memorabilia. It is the diary. You can see it yourself. The Constitution and Bylaws of the Hawkeye Baseball Club, Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And you can see the date, April of 1866. The diary is up here, and I'm very careful. I've made copies of it, so if you actually want to do research, I'll give you the copy, but the original, no. <laughs> and, that, uh, and it's a wonderful read because they talk about meeting at the Brazelton House for the first meetings. They talk about what rules they should adopt and so on. Uh, they talk about election of officers, um, you know, who's going to draft the bylaws. And it's beautiful. I point this out to people. <clears throat> Think of atrocious our handwriting is today, especially men. It's just horrible. A lot of women, especially grandmothers, have beautiful handwriting. This is the handwriting of the secretary, and he's a man. It's gorgeous handwriting. It's really easy to read. It's really easy to read. And it's, it's kind of fun to read because you learn a lot about Iowa history in 1866 in the Mount Pleasant area. They talk about the first teams they play in there, and they talk about a tournament. Every tournament, even if it involved only two clubs, was a championship. Everyone. <laughs> Next. <clears throat> this is the card that got away. I've never seen the original. Um, this appeared in Mark Rucker's Mark was the advisor to Ken Burns when he put together uh, his series on baseball history in the 1990s. And Mark has a company called Transcendental Graphics. At one time had the, most, the largest collection of baseball images outside of Cooperstown, New York. And uh, Mark and I have been friends for 30 years. He lives now in British Columbia. And um, he's never seen this either. But this is Luke Everhart. And the date is wrong. Uh, the Society for American Baseball Research, with my assistance, were able to prove that this should be 1867. He's not in those box scores in 1865. We were able to prove that the Anson family, Henry, Cap, uh, and Sturgis, did not found the Marshall Baseball Club in Marshalltown, because we have the first box scores, and none of the Anson names appear. So that's the part of the fun of playing detective with a lot of these, quote, givens in baseball history, is uh, trying to, is it accurate? Is it true? But uh, look at that. Marshalltown loved their team. Look at the uniform. That's gorgeous. And look at his stance. He's so proud to play for the first nine of the Marshall Baseball Club. For the Marshall Baseball Club. Next. Another town team, not so stiffy. 
This came to me from Mark Rucker, and Mark told me it was the Luther College baseball team from the 1860s, late 18, or early 1870s. So I went to Decora and went to Luther College and got out their college catalogs going back to the year it opened in the 1850s and started looking. The names are all in the back. And of course, they're all Norwegian. You had to be Norwegian to play baseball in Decora. <clears throat> None of the names popped up in the Decora or in the Luther College catalogs. So I said, I think we're in the wrong building. We need to go to the courthouse. And we do, need to look at tax records. And we need to look at, you know, plats. And we need to look at a lot of other stuff. And the names started popping. This is a town team for Decora. A town team for Decora. And I want to point out a couple things in this image. The uniforms are fairly standard, but some have scarves, some don't. All right. But <clears throat> look at the size of that, and then look at the size of that. You could kill an elephant with a big one. <laughs> and then we know this. His name was Fred Thayer. The year is 1877. He's at Harvard University. And he introduces, because he watched fencers using a mask to protect themselves, a catcher's mask. And I think his first name was Jim Ting, T-Y-N-G, is the first one to use in a baseball game a catcher's mask. So we can date that fairly accurately, fairly accurately. And we were able to find out the ages and when the families came to Decora and so on, pinned down a lot of information about this town team. Decora had at one time three town teams, three town teams. Next. I'm watching the time. Baseball was important. Putting your town on the map. And to have a good team was even more important. This is a broadside in the collection at the University of Iowa with the Historical Society there. Two cities, Homiston and Allerton. You can see the year up there, 1891. But the part I like, the latter club is to be strengthened by four players of the famous Shane Hill Club. Can we all say ringers because we want to win this thing? Uh, now, look for, further. This is to be the greatest game of the season, as both clubs will play for blood. <laughs> for blood. No one should fail to see it. John Antler of Bonaparte, who's well known to the lovers of the game, will officiate as umpire, which is a surety of a fair... Is it going to be a quiet and fair game, or is it going to be for blood? It's going, it's going to be for blood. <laughs> All right. And then one other little thing on this broadside. <clears throat> Admission, 20 cents. Ladies, 10 cents. Ladies, 10 cents. I've got some great images in DeWitt, Iowa, of a town team where the women left from church wearing their finest bonnets and they get out their bullhorns and they're sitting up in the bleachers rooting for their town team. I mean, there's some wonderful images of early baseball town teams that do exist. Next. Finally, we get to <clears throat> the guy I dress as. You notice that he's wearing Boston there. <clears throat> he was an 18-year-old kid drafted by... Harry Wright and his brother George, two immigrants from England, to play for the first all-professional baseball team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, in 1869. Now, Cincinnati had had a number of teams before, but if you were professional, you were getting paid under the table. And they were getting trounced by teams from places like New York City and Philadelphia. And they all knew that there were ringers on those other teams, professionals getting paid. So basically, Aaron Champion, a businessman, and Harry Wright decided once and for all to put together a team. Her name was Bertha Bertram. She put the first uniforms together for this team in 1869, and this is a replica of that first team's uniform. A seamstress from Centerville made this for me about 20 years ago. And I don't have the right shoes on, and there are two styles of hats, and I didn't put those on either. But the rest of the uniform is exactly, the material is called cricket flannel. And in the middle of summer, this would be a death sentence, wearing this thing for five hours. Games lasted five hours, six hours. It was not unusual to have scores 140 to 30, that kind of thing. So you can imagine, you know, trying to play on this thing for five hours in the hot sun. That uh, Calvin was the last one invited to play for that team. He had played for the University Nine. Uh, well, let me backtrack to it. He was born in Iowa in 1849. His family struggled to make a go near Montrose, Iowa, north of Keokuk, about six miles on the Mississippi River. And basically, they, they gave it up. His father was a, tried farming, but he was a cabinet maker. Uh, the area was not that populated. They were having a hard time. So they moved back to the Indianapolis area, and he played for the University Nine. And then he played for a team called the Westerns, and then another team called the Actives, all amateur teams. And they were getting beat. 
He was good. Spalding's book that I referred to earlier talks about Calvin McVeigh playing against a team from Washington, D.C., outstanding fielding plays. So he was added, but he was kind of an unknown quantity. Uh, so they put him in right field, and his father had to sign the contract because he was a minor. It was for $800 a year to play baseball for the Cincinnati Red Stockings. The average family income in 1869 was less than $500 a year. And here's a kid who's he's really talented. He's very, very physical. He boxed. He did he, he, pre, long before Ozzie Smith existed. This kid was doing flip-flaps by the Rapids after baseball games. Same type of thing that Ozzie Smith would do. And one of the articles I wrote for Iowa Heritage Illustrated um, is on the life of this guy. And I spent a lot of time researching him. And I wear the uniform to honor Iowa's first professional player. He is in the Iowa Baseball Hall of Fame, the Iowa Sports Hall of Fame. He's not in Cooperstown, even though he's only one of two Iowans to ever bat 400. A 15-year career. Two years with Cincinnati, two years with Boston, a year with Baltimore, including a trip to Europe with George and Harry Wright. I'll talk about that in a minute. Back for two years with Boston again, back to Cincinnati, played for the White Stockings, and then he left to go out to San Francisco as a player manager with a number of different clubs. A total of a 15-year career connected to baseball. He would be invited in 1919, the infamous Black Sox scandal. He was one of two living members of that original team invited to come out, okay, and ride in the back of a convertible in a parade. And he dies in 1926, and he died a pauper. He died a pauper. A couple more images of Calvin. <clears throat> The oldest known commercial baseball card in America. And there are fewer than 30 of these in existence. They were put out by Peck and Snyder's Sporting Goods Company out of New York City. And this is a picture of the Cincinnati Red Stockings, that first all-professional team. And in the back row, second from the right, is Calvin Alexander McVeigh of Montrose, Iowa. And I do have that card up here in my case. Um, this was a, a big-time trade to get this card for my collection. I, I had to pay dearly for that, and I don't mean money. We, we traded some pretty good stuff, but I really wanted this card as part of the collection. <clears throat> that is Mr. McVeigh again on an early scorecard. They're called Mort Rogers by the guy that printed them. One just sold in auction. They come up about once every 10 years for $25,000. All right, so I, I talked about paying 15 bucks for a scorecard today at a major league venue. Forget that stuff. All right, you pay a lot more for one from 1869. Uh, one from the first World Series in 1903 sold for over $100,000. Uh, and that there aren't that many that exist. So, uh, but he's a good-looking guy. He was about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, about my size, weighed about 180 pounds, somewhere in there. Okay? And, and again, I think when he first started playing for Cincinnati, <clears throat> almost all the players, except for there were two other players, had mustaches or facial hair. Uh, Asa Brainerd, the pitcher, had incredible pork chop sideburns and so on and that the Wrights had facial hair. I think it was a requirement on some teams that if you didn't have facial hair, you couldn't play. But, you know, so he goes through different phases. No facial hair, facial hair, no facial hair. Um, <clears throat> next. When they put that team together in Cincinnati, it was time for retribution against those teams from the East that had come and beaten them using ringers. They went out there, and they would end up trouncing every team they played. There were about two close games. And they were lopsided scores, over 100 to 4. All right. When they came back mid-season, mid-season, back to Cincinnati, the owner of a lumberyard wanted to present to the team something to, you know, appropriate for the greatest baseball team that ever played the game. So he makes this 27-foot bat and presents it to the team. And the picture was in Harper's Weekly. Oh, what you could make on eBay if you found this thing, all right? It's long since disappeared. It's long since. But there's, there's you know, journalists covering this, covering this presentation, and they document how it took about eight guys to bring it in and how they presented it to the uh, George Wright as the captain of the team. Their record at the end of that first season, 57-0 and one disputed game. 57-0-1. It revolutionized baseball. Now think about one other thing, too. And we learned this from the Civil War. What did it require to be successful in war? Teamwork, camaraderie, discipline, drilling, training. And what did the Cincinnati Red Stockings do to become professional? They drilled, they were disciplined, they had strict rules, they had spiffy uniforms, and they beat everybody easily. 
They're going to win 24 more games the next season before playing the Brooklyn Atlantics in Brooklyn, a game that 15,000 people watched. In a disputed finish, they lose 8-7. to seven. They lose 8-7. to seven. So maybe one of the longest professional sport winning streaks comes to an end, but the game will never be the same. Immediately, other teams started putting together, all professional teams. And Calvin and three of the other players, including the Wright brothers, will go to Boston because they were offered more money. Offered more money. And that becomes, Calvin the next year is in Baltimore, and he's the youngest player manager in baseball. The youngest player manager in baseball. And if I ask randomly at Iowans that know baseball, do they know who Calvin McVeigh is? I don't hear a thing. I mean, really, they, they, I, I've worked with the city of Montrose, and we finally got a plaque there, did a bunch of fundraising, and they had a ceremony, and I went down there dressed like this, and did a program, and this little town has about 500 people, and there were 1,500 people there uh, for the plaque. Steve knows where Montrose is, he's spent time in Keokuk. But, uh, but obviously, um, I'm working on, and I don't know if I'll get it done, it takes time, I found this, it's not easy to get a sign changed on the highway system working for DOT. If any of you have influence with important DOT people, please grab my card and let me know. And I'm trying to get the birthplace of Iowa's first professional player on Highway 218 and bringing a few more people to Montrose, Iowa. I mean, any little town that can find a niche, a lot of them are dying. They need a niche. They need a niche. So next. That is Calvin McVeigh. When you had your picture taken by a professional studio, you had it both in civilian dress and wearing uniform. The uniform is a full-length picture of Calvin McVeigh, and then you have the one in civilian dress. And what makes this CDV so valuable, next, is that it is one of two known autographs of Calvin McVeigh. It's up here in the case. It's up here in the case. One of two known. Um, oh, what was his name? It was a longtime card collector from Chicago, and I was at a national show set up there. And I had some things in my case he wanted, and he had this. And we worked out a trade, and I've had it ever since. And this is the, not necessarily the most valuable thing in my collection, but probably the hardest thing to obtain, and to me, the most important thing in my collection. And, um, you know, and, and it's not going to go anywhere except either to my kids or the appropriate historical society that will protect it <laughs> and take care of it. Um, you can see that's an older Calvin McVeigh, the second time back. And he's older, and it's not a Gothic C anymore. It's the full word written out. The uniform has evolved just like everything else evolves. He's near the end of his professional career before he goes out to California. Next. A great quote again. Joe just died a few years ago. Now, I met Joe. Uh, he was a card collector, and we could talk baseball cards or baseball. And, uh, but it's so true of catchers. <laughs> they always have an excuse, okay? <laughs> that, uh, well, you know, years ago I was at Yankee Stadium, and I got to watch... Don Mattingly's last game at Yankee Stadium, and they're playing the Tigers. And Cecil Fielder, some of you know that name, he weighed about 320 pounds, and he blasted it out in the, into Monuments Park. And Bernie Williams is out there fielding, and by the time Bernie got to the ball, Cecil was rounding second. Everyone in the stadium thought he'd have a heart attack, everyone. And he had to pause about five feet from second before he headed for third. And it was one of, I think, four triples he hit in his career. <laughs> and it was, but, so, all right, next, we're getting near the end. That's the Marshall Baseball Club. That is Henry Anson in the back row, the old guy with the beard. That's the founder of Marshalltown. The town and all the things in Marshalltown are not named after the baseball player. They are named after the father of the baseball player. Iowa's first Hall of Famer is in the back row to the right, Adrian Constantine Anson, cap. That's our first Hall of Famer. First player to get 3,000 hits. We'll talk about the other side of him in a minute. That's his younger brother in the front to the left, the far left, Sturgis. Both Adrian and Sturgis, and I don't know what it was with his parents, but they're named after towns in Michigan where they had lived before. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I like the picture. Uh, th their club is important. There's a wonderful account, which I talk about in some of my articles, of a championship game being played at a neutral site in late 1866 between the Fort Dodge Wakansas and the Marshall Baseball Club. And it gives all the details about the parades and the banquets and the game, every detail. And all the young ladies' hearts going pity-pat when the handsome boys came out to play baseball. 
Uh, it's, it's a great account. I like the way that the military has a term for how those bats and that ball. The ball has to be just right and the bats have to be just right. It's called stacked arms. Stacked, you move any one of those pieces there, it's going to fall over. It's a great image of a town team. Next. I do have autographs of six of the seven Iowa Hall of Famers. And Anson signed a lot because he went on to be a city clerk in Chicago. Um, he briefly tried a career as an actor and so on. He wasn't very good. But, um, <clears throat> Cap Anson's autograph, what I liked about this, and, and I picked this up again a long time ago, is that how big and beautiful the, the autograph is. And then I put that together with the, the image and so on. Um, very quickly, the seven Iowans in the Hall of Fame, if you can remember this, A, B, C, F, F, V, W. That's the first initial of the last name of the seven. Cap Anson, you know now, that's the A, all right? Dave Bancroft of Sioux City is the B, a great shortstop, nicknamed Beauty. The C is Fred Clark, who you're about to see more images of, and I've got a bunch of cards up here of. Fred Clark from the Winterset area, lived in Des Moines, carried newspapers. He's the manager in the first World Series in 1903. They win the World Series in 1909. Wonderful player, batted, he's the other one that batted over 400, along with Calvin McVeigh. Cap Anson, I think we might have one more of Anson or two more. I'll run through these quickly. Uh, a lot of the early baseball cards were sponsored by chewing tobacco or tobacco companies, and this is Mayo Cut Plug, which is chew chewing tobacco. I have that card. It's kind of beaten up, but it's still worth a lot of money because there aren't that very many of them out there. And that's an image of Anson. Next. Um, the date on there is incorrect. It should be 1899 to 1900. Those are inserts into Sporting News, and they truly are rare. And at one time, I had most of the 103. Um, I traded them, and I kept the Iowans. So I kept the Fred Clark, and I kept the Cap Anson that are in that set. Next. Before we go on, what is... The other side of Cap Anson, I know some of you baseball people know this. Uh, I upset a lot of people when I did my program in Marshalltown because I told them the truth. <laughs> and the truth was that in 1883, the Chicago White Stockings, now managed by the best player in baseball, Cap Anson, were scheduled to play an exhibition game against the Toledo Blue Stockings. The Toledo Blue Stockings took the field first. Moses Fleetwood Walker and his brother Welday Walker went out on the field and immediately, Anson started yelling the N-word. They were African Americans. They weren't the first professional African American players, or players, not professional, all right? But obviously what happened, they were graduates of Oberlin College in Ohio. They were smart guys, and they were excellent baseball players. Excellent baseball players. When Anson, he, he first of all threatened to walk off the field, and then he found out that he would basically forfeit their game receipts if he walked off the field. So he played under protest. But he didn't stop there. He told other teams, by this time you've got the National League has been organized in 1876. He said, if you play against any teams of black players, Chicago won't play you. And it spread. Now remember, this is the controversial presidential election of 1876, where the guy with fewer votes won. And part of the agreement was that he would pull federal troops out of those districts in the Deep South, all right, so we could reenact Jim Crow laws, two Americas, one black, one white, totally unequal, and lynching, and let the KKK do what it wanted to do. And it was happening not just in baseball. It was happening in boxing. John L. O'Sullivan would not box a black man. He wouldn't. It was happening all over America, not just in sports. So that doesn't excuse what Anson did, but we're going to have to wait till 1947 and a really brave little kid named Jackie Robinson. He wasn't a little kid. He was a terrific athlete to reverse that. And we'll never know how good the black Babe Ruth, Josh Gibson, might have been. Or if, you know, some of the other great Oscar Charles and some of the other Negro League players had been allowed to play against white players on their teams and so on. And that, uh, um, aesthetically, that's one reason I collect cards. These are called Allen and Ginters. And this is the first large set. 10 baseball players in the set, 50 cards in the set. It includes wrestlers, boxers, Annie Oakley's in the set, all right? While Bill Cody's in the set. I have most of the set. I do have the 10 players. They're up here in that case over there. And da lower right-hand corner, Cap Anson of Marshalltown. Next. 
Fred Clark, his rookie card, played for Louisville. Pittsburgh didn't exist yet. But in 1903, he is the manager in the first World Series. Fred Clark's 23-year career in the Baseball Hall of Fame deserves to be there. Anson Bancroft Clark, ABC, okay? FFBW, Urban Faber, spitball pitcher from Cascade, Iowa. You'll hear a lot about him because of the Field of Dreams next year. The heater from Van Meter is the other F. You all know his name, Bob Feller. Rapid Robert. The V is Dazzy, Dazzy Vance of Orient, Iowa, a great pitcher for Brooklyn. And the last one, the W, J.L. Wilkinson. And here's the, the teaser. He's inducted in 2006 with a large group of Negro, Negro League players that should have been there earlier, and one woman into the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And here's the amazing thing. He wasn't black, and he wasn't a baseball player. And he's in the Baseball Hall of Fame as a white guy. So who was J.L. Wilkinson from Algona, Iowa? He put together the Kansas City Monarchs. He discovered Satchel Paige. He introduced lights who were hauled on the top of his bus because a lot of the Negro teams weren't allowed to play on the white fields. They'd play after dark sometimes, put up their own lights at an old bus. He was a great marketer and promoter of baseball. He lived in Des Moines for a brief time, worked for an insurance company. I think he lived in Perry, Dave, for a brief time, too. He was born in Algona, but I think he lived in Perry for a very brief time. J.L. Wilkinson, ABC FFVW. There's your Hall of Fame from Iowa. Next. Oh, that, that's a tobacco card. It's about 8.5 by 11 of Fred Clark. There are 50 in the set, and they list on the back all the set. And again, the word aesthetic. I used it a minute ago. They're beautiful. They're works of art. Next. Billy Sunday. I've got three books up here by Billy Sunday. I have some cards. Billy Sunday, everybody knew by 1920 because he was the, along with Amy Semple McPherson, fire and brimstone preacher, preacher in America. Huge audiences. A lot of people aren't aware that in the 1870s and 80s, he played baseball for three different teams. Start, Cap Anson recruited him. He came back to visit family, and he was told about a kid from the Ames area playing for a town team. So he went and watched the game and went up to Sunday and said, I'll pay you if you want to move to Chicago and play professionally. And he did. His baseball career was relatively short. He wasn't a very good batter, but he had terrific speed. Terrific speed. He had one problem, though. Alcohol. All right? And he would be rescued, literally, from falling in a street by someone from a mission. And he devoted the rest of his life to the church and to preaching. But what was different about his preaching from Amy Semple McPherson, she would have an entourage and a 50-foot-long flowing cape, and she would have people throwing flowers, and the stage would be covered. He would come up on the stage in a plain brown suit. He'd have a Bible up there on the stage sometimes. And then he would be all over the stage using the language of baseball. Throw Satan out at home. That kind of stuff, all right? And it's, it's fun to read because he never lost his appreciation for baseball, even though his success came totally for a different reason. Next. That's a picture on a tobacco card called Old Judges of Billy Sunday for Chicago. Next. Uh, that set has over 570 different players, the old judge tobacco cards. But the hard thing is, they're impossible to complete the set. Nobody has. And there are people with deep, deep pockets that will pay $100,000 for one of these. Um, but some of the players have anywhere from 3 to 12 poses. They were all shot in studios. And some of the cards I have here, if you look carefully, you'll see a ball that looks like it's falling into a glove, but it's suspended by a string. You have to look kind of careful, but they're on thick stock cardboard, sepia colored, and if you keep them out of the sun, away from moisture, they've lasted almost 150 years. They're going to be around a lot longer. The Sioux City and Des Moines players, that's what I collect, and then I have some of people like Billy Sunday and, you know, players like that. All right, there's, uh, there's your preacher right there. Next. Uh, I do collect old Des Moines images, and I have quite a few in addition to the old Judge tobacco cards. And these were put out by, it's the Des Moines Club from 1906, and a short story, the guy in the lower left-hand corner, Catherine. I've I'd been to Cooperstown a half dozen times doing research, and Tim Wiles was the research director there. Uh, he married Iowa, and he went to school at UNI, and he went to school at the University of uh, Northern Iowa. And we became pretty good friends over the years, and he said, on about my second trip, you have some old Iowa stuff, would you look through your pictures of Des Moines players and see if you've got a guy named Catherine. And sure enough, he's up there. He played for the Cleveland Spiders in 1906, and part of the season was in Des Moines playing. 
So I made a professional duplicate of this and gave it to Tim, and I've never had to play, pay for copying at the Hall of Fame library since. Okay? They give me a machine and white gloves, and I copy away. <clears throat> All right. Beautiful, beautiful image of the Des Moines team in the 1880s, but what I really like is that's one of six early ballparks that Des Moines played at. A lot of people are aware of the first one down by North High School where that night game was played and so on, but there was Southeast 7th and Scott was the first ballpark in Des Moines in the 1880s where they played professionally, the very first. There was a ballpark in Valley Junction for a brief time. I've got documented all the ballparks, where they were, how long they lasted, but that is a, a great image of the team. Just a couple more. Des Moines players on old judges, again, the aesthetics, this is a Rose and Company postcard from 1909 featuring George Stone from Lost Nation, Iowa. Lost Nation gave us two professional players, Jimmy McAndrew and George Stone. Good player, batted, batted over 350 in the early, the first decade of the 1900s. People ask me my favorite player. Being an acad academician all my life and loving baseball, it's only logical. And I don't know why I picked tragic figures, but Lou Gehrig is obviously my favorite player. And the next image, my other favorite player. Both died way too young. He had got his 3,000th hit, died in a plane crash, delivering you know, supplies to people in Nicaragua and after an earthquake. That's his rookie card, it's up here in the case. Roberto Clemente, and the little story I like to tell, on one of those cards, they put Robert Clemente. No, his name is Roberto, and he's proud of it, okay? He's not Robert. And, and so, um, <clears throat> I think we have one, that was part of my collection, I have two adult children, three, uh, four grandkids. They live on the coast, and years ago, about seven or eight years ago, I had had this card for 30 years, and I got it at a show. A kid wanted to buy a motorcycle, had permission from the family to sell it, and you know there weren't price guides at the time. I didn't rip them off, I paid them what was fair for him, and I took it to shows as a hook for my tables. People would come, and I said, not for sale, the rookie card. He's a pitcher for uh, Boston in 1916. And well, anyway, a couple of years ago, I took my autograph, Babe Ruth Ball, that card held them, had my wife take pictures wearing this uniform, and then I put it in a nationwide auction as lot one and on the cover, and I had paid less than $1,000 for the lot, and I sold it for $88,000. And now that card sells for over $150,000. I go back to money in this hobby, yeah. I mean, I'm just an academic. I don't have that kind of money, but I know how to, I, what I do is I broker collections, and instead of taking money, I take 20% out in cards from collections. I've done that a lot. And, and I have traded at a high level. You know, that team card, the Peck and Snyder, that was about a $13,000 trade to get that. And it, um, we're done. I think one more. One more quote. I love this quote from Johnny Vandermeer. Now, you guys watched the game last night. You've been watching. How many pitchers did you see in some of these games? About 30 pitchers? Early relievers, the middle relievers, the late relievers, uh, the near closers, the closers, the shutdown, whatever they're called. No, no, I'm making fun. But this guy pitched two back-to-back no-hitters. You rarely see a complete game anymore. And when you do, it's a thing of beauty. It's a thing of beauty. You're lucky to be there at that game if you see one in this day and age. <clears throat> Last image. My, my collection was on display at the University of Iowa in the old capital. Uh, the woman whose husband produced the final season, Pam White, uh, they invited me to their home to watch the preview of that. And then she heard about the collection and asked if I would put it on display at the old capital for two months. This is about 10 years ago. And so we had it on display there, and then we had a baseball symposium at the Hoover Library and Museum, and we invited in some of the actors from the movie, and we had Bruce Kim there, and we had Don Denkinger there, umpire in the major leagues back in the 1950s. Uh, we invited a number of people in, and it was a terrific baseball weekend and a chance for me to share my collection, and I've been glad to share it with you today. So thank you, and if you have any questions, I could answer some. We've got about 15 minutes, and we have to be out of here. Questions? Anything? Go ahead. Ken Burns uh, documentary that was done like 25 years ago. Yeah, something like that. Did you, did you find him to be pretty accurate in his history of telling of the, of the baseball? For the most part. A lot of people have found inaccuracies. And, you know, and, and being a historian and nitpicker and being a research person, I could go on forever trying to pick it apart. But I think with what he's done, not just the, I used his series on Lewis and Clark in my classes. I, I used a number of Ken Burns' works. The one on National Parks is fantastic and so on. I've met Ken Burns. He was the speaker at Drake a few years ago for the, bomb, the lecture series they have at Drake. And, uh, and then uh, 
Uh, Dayton Duncan, who lives next door to Ken Burns, uh, is a native of Indianola. And Dayton used to come back when his father was alive all the time. And I got to know him a little bit as well. And I think with what they've done, their collective body of work, they've done a great service for history generally. And so I'm, that doesn't mean I'll stay off, but I'm not going to nitpick either. I think there, there are mistakes in there, and he's admitted to some of those mistakes. Or, you know, the, the things he accents or the things he, you know, dwells on sometimes, maybe not the right priority for a certain decade, that kind of thing. So other, other questions? Yes? What do you know that I know? Extra knowledge of the Field of Dreams game. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do have some knowledge of the Field of Dreams game, and I'll just very briefly share it with you. As soon as they announced that, I ran down... I was on my bike, actually, and I stopped to talk to Sam Burnham of the Iowa Cubs. And I said, Sam, uh, what are the odds of an Iowa getting a ticket to that game? And he said they played a game in Williamsport earlier this year. And Major League Baseball brought up all 7,500 tickets, okay? And then they made some available. They knew the Little Leaguers would be there. And it really would have looked bad if there were no Little Leaguers in the audience when they played that game. So obviously, they did make some available. Now I said, would a thousand bucks get me a ticket at the Field of Dreams here? And he said, it won't touch it. It'll be $5,000 for a ticket, okay? $5,000. But he said, what he said is that if you've got an angle, and this is going to be my angle, I know Iowa baseball history. I'm going to contact ESPN and whoever else is broadcasting this thing and say, I'm available for, you know, sitting down and talking to you. I know about Urban Faber, and that uh, Urban Faber is from Cascade, which is really close to there. And, you know, and, and so that's the only way I hope to get a ticket. And, but it'll look terrible if they don't have, by lottery or some way, some chance for some Iowans to be sitting in the bleachers when they go around interviewing and saying, where are you from? I thought if I got a room at the uh, Hotel Julian Dubuque, that one of the teams might stay there because it's the biggest hotel in Dubuque, and all remodeled, it's beautiful. I called the hotel the next day, and they had already blocked out a week around that date, and they weren't letting anybody reserve rooms. And then they found out that both the White Sox and the Yankees are probably going to fly in in private jets that morning and fly out that night and won't be staying in Dubuque. And so, <laughs> I don't want to depress anybody, but it's not going to be easy to get a ticket. I'll put it that way. And, and that came, Michael Gardner and Sam will get tickets, okay? The governor will get a ticket, all right? <laughs> Beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> well, since it wasn't the Cubs, I wasn't asked. Yeah, well, I'd love to be there. And I'm going to, every angle I can think of, I'm going to try to be there. And, you know, they're going to have some kind of expo or something to go with it. And hopefully I can, you know, have some of this stuff there. And I'll say, I'll come, but the agreement is I don't need to be paid, but just one ticket. Anywhere in the bleachers will do. Two, maybe for my wife. That's my wife, Diane, in the back there. She came in to help me haul stuff out. So, <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes? You said the game would last five hours? Oh, yeah. That was not unusual at all. And it was nine innings? Oh, no, 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 no. There were no set innings for a while. Until, <laughs> I tell you where the other team out or lightning came or something. Last question, trivia question. The Nationals are going to play Houston. Who are the two Iowans involved in the World Series? Help me out here. Raise a hand. Oh, Steve, you're, that's not fair. Steve's a member of Sabre, Society of American Baseball Research. Just this gentleman from Rochester is a member of Sabre. Um, they can't answer any of these questions. <laughs> I don't know if they know this. I don't know if you know the two islands. All right, give us one, Steve. The Houston manager, Hinch. Age Andrew J. Hinch is the manager for Houston. Born in Waverly, Iowa. Had a career that lasted about five years, played for four different teams, and then you know, started working first before he became manager. He worked for promotions for Houston and so on. A.J. Hinch, he's an excellent manager, excellent manager. Uh, on the other side, Washington, really close to home, guys. His nickname is Hellboy. Jeremy Hellickson's with Washington. But he's been fighting injuries. Rookie of the year a few years ago. Five different teams. So one of my friends asked me, who am I rooting for? Uh, the Yankees. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> no, no, I'd have arguments for you know, either, either team. I, I really, Houston's won it recently. Washington, a lot of people don't know they play baseball in D.C. So, you know, they're obviously David against Goliath right now. And the Houston players are terrific. From day one, I picked them to win the whole thing at the beginning of the season because of their pitchers. They have the best pitchers in baseball, and that's hard to beat no matter how good you are. But Washington's been on a roll. So we'll see what happens. I'll watch and wait for next year. A lot of the Yankee players are young. CeCe Thabathia is about the only really old pitcher. So, but uh, you've got to be consistent with their pitching. Any other questions? 
Take a few minutes, come up and look, and we'll get out of here in about 10 minutes.